earth. Welcome to church. I love the fact that the sun is rising earlier. The sun is setting later. There may be snow, but it's warm in here. Praise God. So if you're joining us online or you're in the building, we're glad you're here. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us what? Rejoice and be glad. So we're happy you're here this Sabbath morning. I have a few announcements today. We're going to break a little bit with our tradition, so bear with us. Number one, we just are giving you a first reading of transfer of membership of Rodney Balmas from Central Filipino Church in L.A. to Hinsdale, Philam, and his lovely wife, Jolene, from Orlando Filipino Church to Hinsdale, Philam. This is the first reading, so we're going we're to be welcoming them next Sabbath with a final reading, okay? Number two, this afternoon, 3.30, we want you back at church. Our women's ministry has a special program. It's at a health lecture by Dr. Tessaly, COVID and the heart health. You heard of COVID, right? And you have a heart. So come here at 3.30 p.m. Join us for our health lecture. You're going to get to ask some questions. Um, Dr. Tesla is going to be very informative. Second announcement. Tomorrow morning at Hinsdale Adventist Academy, we have a breakfast, pancake breakfast, for all of you who love to eat pancakes. Unlimited, all you can eat. Man, that's the all-American way. Come join us at HAA. The proceeds are going to our senior class. They've had a rough year, guys, because they have COVID. But we want them to go on a class trip. And we senior in this, Mr. Kevin Gabriel, and he's even working on it today. So all the proceeds go to him from this church, OK? So here's how it's going to happen. Tomorrow between 8.30 and 11.30, go to the school, buy your tickets, say it's to Kevin. For those of you who can't, this is what I want you to do. I want you to buy a ticket anyway and tell Kevin or give him, give him a promise today that you will pay him. That way we save money and we get him sponsored. How's that? So help Kevin out or and all the seniors. I'm teasing a little bit, but, but I'll remind, remember Kevin, okay? Last, last thing we have to do today is Every year, every four years, we have the Illinois Conference Constituency. This year is a constituency year. We have to send 10 delegates from our church and two alternates. The church board has voted these names to present to you today. I simply want a vote that you agree that these names are suitable to represent our church. All of these folks are Members in good, in good standing, they, they, they will represent our church well. This is a one-day meeting in Eland, it, right here at Hinsdale, the big church. So if you see your name, um, don't worry, there's not a big time commitment. And the meeting, I believe, is in October, October 21 or 23. So you have some time to set aside, okay? So these are the names. I'll read it for you. Emmanuel Laxon, Adeline Bautista, Ranja Ambao, Carlin O'Brien, Michai Tessily, Joel, Joel Guerra Sr., Kurt Martz, Lisa Demolibo, Lawrence Asuncion, that's Don, the junior, the, the younger, more handsome one. Maricel, two alternates is Elma and Uncle Francis, okay? So if you approve those names, I want you to raise your right hand for me. And if you don't approve, don't raise your right hand. But if there's, if there's a, if we, this is a carried, okay? So one more biz, item of business, okay? I'm gonna ask Uncle Larry to come up here. We have a little change in a, a church position. Uncle Larry is the chairman of our MMT committee, so he has to bring the name for a vote. We just wanted to get that done today so this person can start serving, okay? So Uncle Larry. Yeah, a recommendation was given to us from uh, the Youth Council <clears throat> and uh, they are proposing uh, a new youth leader and that is uh, Annie Mbao 
that is being presented to the MMT. We have uh, uh, discussed about it, made a decision, and so we are putting out the proposal for the church to approve, uh, making uh, Anium Bao as the new uh, youth leader. Is, is there any uh, motion to this effect? Move and seconded. Second. So before we do a votation, is there any question? So there's no question. Those who are in favor for the proposal for the nomination of Anion Bao as the new youth leader, you please raise your right hand. Those who are opposed may do the same. I think it's carried. So now we have a new uh, youth leader, Ani Umbao. Thank you. Okay, I don't like announcements because it takes away from our worship. But now it's time to worship. So I'm gonna sit, uh, share this Psalm with you, Psalm 95. It says this, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. So I pray today that you have come to worship, that you have come to sing, that you have come to praise, because I know you will be blessed. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to church. Let's all stand as we sing today.
Dear God and Father, we come to you at this hour with thankfulness for your great love and care. We thank you for being with us. As we went about our daily activities. We thank you, Father, for providing us this Sabbath day where we can find rest from our labors. We thank you for this day where we can celebrate the rest afforded to us by your son's sacrifice on the cross. We pray that you, that you teach us not to hold back but to deliberately lay our burdens, our worries, our anxieties, our concerns, or whatever is troubling us, to lay these things at the foot of the cross so we may find rest for our souls. Father, as we observe the world around us today, we see history repeating itself. We see a self-centered despot conquering a neighboring country to regain a lost empire with resulting death and disruption of countless lives, not to mention the disruption of the world order. We see democratic institutions being undermined. We see civil disorder flaring up here and there. We are in troubled times. We come to you, Father, to assure us that you are always in control. At, at this first Sabbath day of this unjustified Russian-Ukrainian war, we lift up to you our fellow Ukrainian Seventh-day Adventists who number 43,000 members in 784 churches. As they celebrate Sabbath this weekend, Remind them, Father, that through the chaos, destruction, and death in war, you are still in control. 
and closer to home, Father. We have in our community family members who are suffering from cancer, a devastating disease which is regarded as the emperor of all maladies. We can only imagine the suffering they are going through and the disruption in their lives. We also have family members who are suffering the long-term effects of COVID-19 infection. We ask that you be with the afflicted and their families. Assure them that you are still in control. Father, we are a community of believers that meet together week by week. We are disheartened that people we know and close to us no longer find church life relevant to their lives. Help us to find ways as a church to be relevant to our family members, to our friends, and to our neighbors. Just as Apostle Paul at various times lived like a Jew, lived like a Gentile, lived like a person who is weak in faith, to be all things to all people, we pray that you help us be adaptable, that we can be channels for satisfying the spiritual needs of people around us and of people we encounter. Today, we pray, Father, that you speak your mind through our lead pastor as he teaches us on the unifying aspect of prayer. May we be blessed today with your presence, with the hearing of your word, and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. And those of you who are watching online, we want to welcome you as well. I was reminded by our head elder here, Jason, that there are 50 people right now, at least 50 people watching. So we, uh, we are thankful that you are present with us, <clears throat> even though you're in the comfort of your own home and maybe your pajamas. We're thankful that you're, you're watching with us. <clears throat> So, you know, I moved in August or the end of July here to Illinois from the state of Colorado. And one thing I loved doing in Colorado when I had the chance <clears throat> is uh, skiing. Anyone like skiing here? So you have skiers here? So I really wanted to ski. You know, once you have children, you're, you're limited in what you can do outdoors, especially skiing and snowboarding and, and the like. And I thought to myself, you know, there's this one park called Winter Park. And in Winter Park, they have one free, one, free run. So uh, it's a green run, an easy run, easy run, and it's a free lift. So you save yourself $160 for a lift ticket, and you can just go there with your own equipment and ski on this one lift, uh, this, this free green run. And I was desperate to get out and ski. Eliana was two and a half years old. And, and uh, my brother-in-law, Johnny, he had his son, Zachy, who was also two and a half years old. And we thought, let's rent skis and try to take them skiing. So we took them out to the slope. And we went up the lift. And when we put the kids down, this is all we heard. Ah, 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 we don't want it. We don't want it. We're cold the whole time. We were trying to enjoy ourselves, and, and I tried to <clears throat> put Eliana uh, uh, and hold her arms while we were going down, and she's like, no, no, no. And so what was I going to do? I wanted to ski. And so what I did is, you know those uh, baby carriers? I wore Eliana uh, um, on, on my chest, went up the ski lift, went down. It was safe, okay? We had a helmet. We were okay, okay? We had, we had helmets and, and goggles. We were good. And 
she had a grand old time. I had a great time because I was able to ski with her and I, I had to make sure I was safe and we didn't crash. We went down probably six, seven times. We had a great old time. And when we, we, went, we got back to the car to go back home, this whole time they were complaining how cold it was. And I, I'll never forget when we put the, the kids in the, the uh, back row of my brother-in-law's minivan, we asked the kids, I have it on video, did you guys have fun? Yeah, and they were just crying, their, they were just crying their heads off. It was nap time and it was just the end of the world. And I looked at my brother-in-law and we laughed at each other. And there was one lesson that I learned through that crisis. We're better together. We are better together. My brother-in-law and I, Johnny, we jumped in the hot tub that night just to, you know, warm up and, and just to relax after a stressful day because the kids were just having such a hard time. We are better together. We are better together. Do you believe that? You know, in our society, we, we go into our caves, right? We go to work, nine to five, nine to six. Then we go into our cave, our garage, and we just hide ourselves and exclude ourselves from our neighbors and society. Could it be that our culture, especially our Western individualistic culture, does not prize and does not see the power and the benefit of being together? I believe that there is a, there's a word for us in Acts chapter 1, that we are better together. This is the last message of our series, First Things First. It's entitled, A Lesson from Hyenas, A Lesson from Hyenas. By the way, just a side note, on March 19, so in a few weeks, we are going to change our worship service time. Not by a lot. We're going to move it from 11.30 to 11.15. Just a 15-minute window, 15-minute time change for the sake of our young ones and for the sake of, of uh, starting a little bit earlier. So just note that on your calendars. You can circuit out on your calendar. March 19, we're going to start our worship service at 11.15. So don't miss it because we're better together, right? So we want to be on time. Let's say a word of prayer. We're going to jump into, the, into today's teaching. Let's pray. Father, here we are learning, growing, studying how we can put first things first, how we can put prayer first, how we can put the most important habit and activity that we can do each day first. Please help us, Lord. Please help us and teach us how we can be better together. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, Acts chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn there, whether it's a physical Bible or a digital Bible, and we're just going to be reading from the text. And I'm going to be showing you some powerful points from these passages. Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. So what's the context here? The 11 apostles are with Jesus. He had just died. He was now resurrected. He was with the disciples for about 11 days. I'm sorry, 30, 30 days. And notice what happens in verse 9. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Now when he, speaking about Jesus, had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. The disciples are looking at each other. Are you serious? We just spent 30 plus days. We saw the... the, the, the uh, the uh, scarred hands, I, we saw that he was alive, he was talking with us, he was giving us advice and counsel and co commands and, and what we should do after he leaves. And, and, and as he was talking to them, all of a sudden Jesus begins to ascend and they, they watch Jesus ascend, hover over the off the ground. Wow. They're gazing into the sky and verse 10 says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Two angels stood by. While they're surprised, while they're shocked, these two men appear. And they say, disciples, look at this, next verse, verse 11. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Are you serious? He's going to come back. 
He's going to come back. We're, we were just with him. He's gone, but he's going to come back. Really? What? Look at the next verse, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. That's where they were, mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So the disciples, they were with Jesus on Mount Olivet. They watched him ascend. What was Mount Olivet? It, it, Mount Olivet is a two and a half mile long mountain ridge that towers over the eastern side of Jerusalem. And it took them about a Sabbath day's journey to travel from Mount Olivet down to Jerusalem. What is that? A, a, a Sabbath day's journey was about 0.6 miles, so 0.62 miles, so two thirds of a mile. So they raced down to Jerusalem after they saw Jesus ascend. And look what happens in verse 13. Next verse, here we go. And when they had entered, speaking about the 11 apostles, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. This is the place they were lodging. And notice what the text says. Who was there? Peter? James? John? Philip? Oh, Andrew? Philip? And Thomas? Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. You count that? That's 11 people. What's up? What's up with uh, that number? What's up with number 12? What happened? We know Judas Iscariot hung himself, gone. 11 left. All mentioned by name. Look at verse 14. Here we go. Then these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. All right? So now it's more than the 11. Now we have all these women who are with, with Jesus, and we also have Jesus' brothers. Now, when you read this text, we think, you know, at first glance, we think, oh, yeah, a group of people praying together. They're all in harmony. Now, what is harmony? Let me give you a music lesson here, okay? Harmony, what, how do I describe Harmony. Harmony is when you have more than one note, right? And the, uh, it, just make, it just feels good, right? It just, it just tastes good, right? It hears, it hears good. Does it make sense? So it, <coughs> it harmonizes, right? So this is a basic triad, a chord, chord structure, C, E, and G, okay? So when you read verses 13 and 14 of Acts chapter 1, you're thinking, oh, yeah, you got these 11 apostles and all these women and... And Jesus' brothers, and they're all in harmony, just hanging out together, praying together. The reality is they are not in harmony. They're, they're, they're more like this. Okay, what is that called? What is the opposite of harmony? Yeah, discordant, discordance, disharmony, disunity. It's, it's like when my kids play piano at, at home. At first glance, we think they're in harmony. But when you actually dig deeper into the text, we realize that there's dissonance. There's dissonance. The chords don't work. How do we know that? Who was Peter? Peter was impulsive. James was fanatical. John was passionate. Andrew, he was open-minded. Philip was inquisitive. Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas, he was a pessimist. I won't believe Christ until he actually shows me his hands and his feet. I'm not going to believe. Bartholomew, he was composed. Matthew, humble. James, the son of Alphaeus, he was quiet. Simon, the zealot, strong-willed. Judas, the son of James, intense. So you got the 11 apostles, this motley group. This dissonant group. And then, and then it, the text says in verse 14 that the women are there as well. Women in their culture were like second-class citizens. They had no status in society during that time. Dissonance. You got the 11 apostles, this, this dissonant group, plus these women who were second-class citizens. And then the text that says that, that um, Christ's brothers were in that group. If you read in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John... Do you think that his brothers liked their brother Jesus going around doing ministry? No way, Jose. Who are you to tell us? We don't believe that you're the Christ. You're crazy. We think at first glance that there's harmony. But this is the reality. 
there's disharmony in the group. The disciples are dissonant. These followers of Christ are dissonant. And we're not, we're, not so, we're not so different from them, are we, as a church and as a people? We, too, are dissonant. We, too, are divided, aren't we? We're, di- we're divided whether we should get a vaccine or not. We're divided if we should be a Republican or a Democrat or something else. Our nation is divided over race. We are divided over rulership and power. Case in point, look, what hap- look what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. What about the church? We're divided over, we're dissonant and, and divided over tradition or experimentation, legalism or liberalism. And in this local community, we're divided over should we be ethnocentric or should we be multicultural? Should we be a church for ourselves or should we be a church for the people that are just across the street within a, within a five mile radius? Who are we? So we got dissonance in the world, we got dissonance in the church. We have personal dissonance. Children just experiencing disharmony with their parents. I can't believe my parents have done this or are doing this. I, t- I can't stand my parents. There's disharmony between friends, people who haven't talked in so long because there's disharmony. There's this disharmony in, in family relationships. And I, I don't have to give examples. I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of us can think of some disharmony and dissonance within our very own families and extended network of family. We are dissonant and we are divided. And you know what the problem is when we're dissonant and we're divided? At some point, we're going to break. I was in Colorado before coming here, and uh, I really hate when, like, rocks hit my windshield. And this, this rock, a, a while ago, I think even, like, the beginning of last year, hit my windshield, little, just a little hole on my windshield. Little, little, not hole, but a little crap. And I thought, you know, give it some time, we'll be okay, and nothing's going to happen. All of a sudden, I, I left the, the church office, and I noticed that on my CRV, my Honda CR, my 2013 CRV, this nice car that we just bought a few years ago, there was a complete uh, crack, like a horizontal crack, probably this wide on my windshield. Like, where did that? Ha- how in the world did that happen? On this this new, it's a it's a new used car, so it's still new. How could this happen to our windshield? You know why? Because I ignored the crack. The more sand and wind and rain and snow get into that crack, if you don't deal with that crack, what happens? The glass breaks. And I fixed it before coming here. And on my way to Illinois, guess what? Another rock hit my window, and I'm just waiting for the next crack. Pray for me. What's the point? A little crack, a little division, a little dissonance will break the glass. So what can we do to make sure that we don't crack? Verse 14, here's the answer. Here's the solution. First phrase, verse 14. These all, this motley group, this dissonant group of believers, all what? They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Let me read that to you again. This motley dissonant group of believers, according to the text, verse 14, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. What does that mean? That word continued is also translated, they devoted themselves. It's like um, the vows you made with your spouse, right? I devote myself to you for the rest of my life till death do us part. And vice versa. These apostles, these disciples, these women, they all come together. They devote themselves, right, with one accord. What is, what is one accord? It's not talking about uh, the Honda Accord. What's this talking about? One accord means uh, with one mind. Come on, Pastor, are you serious? This dissonant group of personalities and, and social status and, and brothers who didn't like Jesus, like, they're all different, but they can have one mind? Yes. This dissonant group 
devote themselves with one mind to what? To private prayer? No, 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 no. They devote themselves to united corporate prayer. What's the point? United praying makes a united people. United praying makes a united people. Let me just share a few examples here. I remember it was when I was in seminary, and uh, I met some good friends. I think I shared this a few weeks ago. And I didn't just want to learn about God, but I wanted to know God. There's a difference between studying him and actually knowing him as a personal friend and savior, someone that I cherish and delight and enjoy talking to. And I, 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 I saw some friends, I met some friends, and I'm like, look, we're not, a, we're not a united group. And so what we did is we met week after week, just asking how we're doing in our, our prayer lives. You know, we would, we would say, um, you know, okay, I would answer the question on a scale from 1 to 10. How would I rate the consistency and the enjoyment of my time with God, my, like my actual prayer time and my reading time, my devotional time? And we would do that week after week after week. Let me tell you something. Every time we met, it brought us closer and closer and closer together because I wholeheartedly believe that united praying makes a united people. What about family? When you have dissonance in your family, strange people even overseas that you don't even talk to, what would happen? What would happen, even with that dissonance, what would happen if instead of talking about that individual, you fill in the blank to other people that you would talk to that person, you would talk to God about that person? And I, I, I sense God spoke to me. Hey, Nestor, you're doing a lot of thinking about this individual. Why don't you start praying to me about that individual? Good point, God. Thank you. For some reason, coming together and praying together, united praying makes a united people. You know, as I think about this church, we're never going to agree, agree on everything, right? Um, some people, they, they like Asian food is their favorite food, right? To some others, it's Italian. Those are preferences. I mean, I just think about my marriage. I'm a morning person. I love waking up early when I can. Catherine enjoys sleeping in a little bit longer than I do. I mean, I, I, if I could in a perfect world, I'd, I'd wake up at 4.30 every morning. It's not happening right now, right? At least in my stage of life. We're different. But is it possible for people who are different to still be in unity? To still be of one mind? Yes. We're never going to agree on everything. But we can move together with one mind as long as we are praying together. Listen, friends, I don't believe that God is looking for uniformity. I don't expect you to look like me, and I don't expect myself to look like you. And to think like you and to believe like you. To believe exactly the, the same way that you think. God is not looking for uniformity. He is looking for unity. The best example of this is the Trinity. There is diversity of roles. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Diversity. But they have unity in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Different roles. Diversity but they still have unity. And why do they have unity? Because they are nodding together and they are talking to each other and they're praying together and they're enjoying each other's company. Hallelujah. And so I wonder, I wonder if it is true that united praying makes a united people, how much are we praying for each other? And how much are we praying with each other? How much are we praying for each other? How, many, how much are we praying with each other as a corporate body? Look, this year, the elders, in the last two meetings, we've been discussing and brainstorming. So what is it going to take to really make prayer, united prayer, personal prayer, family prayer, to make prayer a, a, uh, 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 an emphasis, a focus for, for our church? And the elders came up with, look, the seven days of prayer that we had, in January, could we not do that at least two more times this year? And so the pastoral team is taking that, um, 
that, that recommendation and, and, and gonna, we're going to be scheduling it in 2022. But what about weekly rhythms of united prayer here in, the, here in this church? I just want to let you know that our elders, we pray every Wednesday night from 8.30 to 9 p.m. And we're praying for our church, we're praying for ourselves, we're praying for you. But we have a weekly prayer meeting that meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. on Zoom. There's a women's prayer group that just started last Sunday at 7 p.m., every Sunday at 7 p.m. I know of two small groups that meet every Friday night that come together that study the word and they pray. That's a weekly rhythm. What about the weekly rhythm of, of worship service and coming together and, and praying together? There, there are opportunities for us to pray together. I, mean, I remember, uh, now just speak, speaking about friends, uh, two friends in Colorado, some close friends, they, uh, they were having a hard time having a child, and we just prayed and prayed and prayed. One year, two years, they tried three years, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, and finally after ten years, God blessed them with their child. And they came to us as friends and said, hey, guys, can you pray? And we united with them and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I believe that uniting, united prayer makes a, makes a united people. We draw close, we drew closer together. God bless them. What about your marriage and, and what about your relationship? What about your, your, um, your, uh, your special friend? What if you started praying together? You want to get closer together? Start praying together. Like last night, Catherine and I, we were just thinking about all the stuff we've been going through with my family and, 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 and raising kids. And, and I said, you know what, Kat? Let's just kneel down at the foot of our bed and let's pray. And that's what we did. Just knelt down and we prayed. And I believe that us joining together in prayer drew, drew us, draws us closer together. United praying makes a united people. I remember when my father passed on New Year's Eve that night. A group of you came to my house. You showed love to my family and you prayed for us. And then the next day, we had a group of elders come to my house. And you prayed for me. You prayed for us. You prayed for our family. Thank you. United praying makes a united people. I can say from the bottom of my heart that this is a caring and a loving church. I can say that without a shadow of a doubt. Because you supported me and you came. And I feel closer to you. We feel closer to you. Why? Because you, you united with us in praying for us. United praying makes a united people. But why do we pray together? Notice verse, verse 4, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Here we go. We're going to fly through this. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 now. Here we go. And being assembled together with them, speaking about the 11 apostles, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, therefore, when they had come together, they asked, say, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What's going on here? He's saying, look, Jesus is looking at his disciples. He's saying, look, I want to do something special through you. And so I want, what I want you to do is I want you to pray. And as you are waiting and as you are praying and as you are pressing together, I'm going to give you something special. Verse, verse one, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power. In the Greek, that's dunamis, by which we get the word dynamite. You're going to wait. I want you to pray. And I'm going to give you dynamite. I'm going to give you power over the enemy. I'm going to give you power over that lion, that, that, that lion, the devil, that seeks whom he to devour. I'm going to give you strength. And I'm going to give you power. And I'm going to allow the, 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 the gospel and the, the word of God to spread. And to, to, to st I'm going to send my spirit to give you power, to give you strength, to start and to initiate, and, and, and to, to initiate this church, inaugurate this church. The title of this message, A Lesson from Hyenas. I watched a YouTube clip of uh, some hyenas. And, you know, they're, they're not really cute animals you want in your house as pets. They're wild. They'll, they'll just tear your couches to pieces and maybe, maybe will even tear you to pieces. Don't have hyenas in your house. 
And then a lion comes in in the video. You know, the lion's trying to take down, take down the hyenas, right? You see, you see in the video one hyena, a second hyena. Then a third comes out of the bushes, a fourth, a fifth, and this lion who thinks he can take one down can't take, can't take the hyenas down. Why? Because there's strength in numbers that we are better together. And when the hyenas come together, and whether not just one or two coming together, several come together, there's power. And in the church, when the 11 and, and, and the women and, and, and Jesus' brothers in the verse 15 says that there's about 120 people in their upper room, when they come together, something special happens when they pray together, when they unite together. And, and I don't know about you, but every time I come together and I come together with my friends or my family or my church family, I have this, this, stre- this, this sense of strength and power that God is going to do something. And when the enemy tries to come at me, he runs away. Because how can the, 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 the lion who seeks to devour us destroy us and take us down when we are together and we have the power of the Holy Spirit? Get away from us, lion. Get away from us, devil, because we're together. The enemy flees when we pray together. But friends, the primary reason why we come together and pray is not just for power. We pray primarily to be in harmony with God. Let me break this down to you. Verse 5, look at this. Verse 5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is saying, look, you need to wait and you're going to be baptized. What does baptized mean? That you are completely immersed by the Spirit of God, right? And then verse 8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So this, this second person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, for some reason comes down upon people. And then in verse 4, notice, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to what? Wait for the promise. All right, come on, Luke. What are you talking about? Luke is the author of Acts. What are you talking about? Wait for the promise. The, the, the link... The promise, was pro- the promise is in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. The same author, Luke, writes this. Behold, this is Jesus speaking. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Let me write this down. Okay? So, here we go, here we go. Just the time it feels, there we go. Praise the Lord. Luke 24, what verse? 49, you wait for the promise, right? Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are, what word is, what word is that? Can you read my handwriting? You wait until you are endued with power from on high. What does the word endue mean? Anyone know? The word in do means to uh, provide a quality or ability. In the original language, it means to put any kind of thing on oneself, clothe oneself on, or to wear on. It's like, it's like um, here, this is, this is what in do means. I'm going to wear the Holy Spirit. But then I saw this in the definition, and this, was, this, is, this is powerful. They say that the word in dude metaphorically means the taking on of characteristics, virtues, and intentions. Let me explain it this way. You guys are still confused. To, to be endued with something means that I adopt the character, the values, the intentions, the thoughts of the thing that's coming upon me. Meaning, to wait for the Spirit and to pray together for the Spirit means that I am taking on God's characteristics, that I'm taking his virtues and his intentions. That praying for the spirit together and waiting and saying, God, please give us the spirit, means that I am becoming and thinking and living and saying and talking and, 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 and living like God. I'm becoming like him. You still don't, you're still confused. When we pray together and press together and unite together as a church and as friends and as family, what's happening? We're coming together and we're praying for the Spirit and what we're, what's happening is that we are becoming 
in step with God. Let me explain it this way. When we join together and pray for the Spirit, you're saying, God, your characteristics, your virtues, and your, your thoughts are like mine. Have you guys ever seen the three-legged race? Have you played that before? Okay, so you take your, let's say this is a person. You take your, uh, your left leg, and you tie it to the leg, the right leg of that person, and you try to walk together, right? Does that make sense? So you try to, you try to walk together. So every step, the only way that you can win the race is if you're in step, right? So to pray for the Spirit of God means to be endued, means to take on his character and his thinking and his, his, his thoughts. And so when we're praying together as a church, we're actually be thinking like him and becoming like him so that we, we serve like him and we worship like heaven does. And we're, we're spreading the gospel like he did. And we're praying together. And we're loving like he did. Is that making, is that making sense? The spirit, God is, God is, Jesus is asking the disciples to stay and wait and pray for the promise because he wants to actually change this. He gives the power of the spirit to his people. And then they become like him. And then Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2, and he spreads the gospel, and he tells people why. It's just a representation of what God wants to do by telling everyone about Christ. So united prayer, number one, makes a united people. Number two, we pray together to be in step with God, last but not least. How is it even possible for us to be united with God and with each other? The verse is in verse 3, then we're done. Notice chapter, Acts chapter 1, now in verse 3. We'll read, start with verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, here we go. To whom he, who is this speaking about? Jesus. He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What is going on here? How is it even possible that we can unite together and pray to be endued with the spirit of God, to have his character, to have his spirit, and to have his power? How is that even possible? It's because Jesus is alive. That's why. Verse one, ver chapter 1, verse 3 says that Jesus Christ is alive. And he, he gave them proof of his existence for 40 days, for 30 days. He showed up no, for 40 days, showed him proof for 40 days. Came 10 days later on day 50, or the spirit came down in Acts chapter 2 on day 50. For 40 days he showed up, and he, 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 he spoke of the things, things of God. He actually showed himself. But here's the key. Here is why it's possible for us to unite with God and with each other. Because our Savior, according to verse 3, text says that he suffered. That's why. That's why we can pray together and we can press together as a, as a church community. Pastor, what does that suffering look like? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, they were always together, inseparable, united, never divided. But the moment that Jesus began to climb Golgotha's hill and be crucified, it was the minute they began to feel the separation. When Jesus was laid on that cross, what did he say to the Father? Father, Father, he quotes Psalm, why have you what? Why have you forsaken me? We have always been united, but now we are divided. The father looks down at the son. I can see a, a tear in his eye. Here, is, here he is, the, the son of God, Jesus. He's crying out. He feels forsaken. He's taking the sin of the, of the world upon himself. I can imagine the spirit, third person of the God, the spirit coming. What's going on? I feel this. We were always together. Now the son is different from the father and me. The Trinity, the Godhead, 
who have always been together, inseparable, always in unity, experience great separation and division. It's like right now in Ukraine, they're giving weapons to young men to fight this war. And some of them are saying goodbye to their wives, their, their spouses, and to their children, maybe for, the very last, maybe for the very last time. Can you imagine the pain of knowing that they could be separated forever? This is what the Father, the Spirit, and the Son experience to an infinite degree that we may never ever be together because Jesus is taking upon himself the eternal penalty of sin that humanity deserves. And then Jesus goes all the way to the cross and he dies the death that we deserve. He comes out of that grave a few days later. Jesus is coming up. He's coming up. I thought we were, the angels are like, we thought we were divided, we're defeated. No, 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 no. Jesus is coming up. He's ascending to heaven. The unity and the harmony of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit could be completed because they came together because Jesus died and he was resurrected. And it's because of that resurrection, because of their unity that we, a divided people, we can have unity. Look, we are divided on many fronts. But, be, but we can be united. We can be united because God was divided. His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, that division that he experienced, makes it possible for us to be united with the Father and united with each other. And I'll close with this. In Acts chapter 2, it says that the Spirit of God came upon the, the people of God. The first church, Peter started preaching. 3,000 people became part of the church. That was the first Christian church. Why is that? Why did that happen? Well, we could easily say because of verse 12 through 14, because they were praying together. But why do they pray together? Well, because verses 4 through 8, because they were waiting for the promise of the Spirit, because Jesus told them to, because they wanted that promise, right? Right? What I'm doing here is root cause analysis, right? Just asking why, why, why? What is the cause and what is the cause? What is the cause? Well, why were they waiting for the promise? Because this Jesus said in verse 3 that he would give them the Spirit of God, that he, was, he actually showed them that I'm going to give you the Spirit of God, right? And then he presents himself alive after he suffered, so the reason why the Spirit of God came upon the church of God was because the people of God were praying because God promised them that. Well, the reason why they were wanting to fulfill that promise is because Jesus actually showed up after he suffered. Meaning, as we're talking about this, the, the, this church, meaning that the reason why we pray in unity together is because Jesus suffered for us. That's why. And I want to encourage us, friends, to keep looking and beholding the one who died for us. This Christ, the divisions that we experience as, as a church, as people, as family members, and as a nation can be healed because he who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus was divided but yet he unites us with him and we can unite together in prayer. Amen. So we're going to talk we're talking about united prayer. How can we talk about united prayer without actually praying? Can we do that? So we're going to have Jaden come up here and we're going to have just a time of praying together as a church as we pray. This is what the church did. This is what God asks us to do, verse 14, to unite together in prayer. So friends, these few moments, if it's possible, let's kneel together. Can we kneel together, if possible? And let's pray to this God corporately and talk to this God.
who wants to take us who are divided and to unite us together in prayer. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're here together as a, as a people. And we are thankful, Lord, for your great love, your great mercy, for the gifts that you give us in Jesus. Thank you for this passage, Lord. Verse 14 says that the, this diverse, dissonant group came together and were able to have harmony despite their differences because they were united together in prayer. And so we unite together. And we're thankful, Lord, for what Jesus did on Calvary, the division that he experienced for us so that we could be united as a people with, with one mind and one purpose with you. And so, Father, in this time, we want to take a few moments in the silence of this moment to actually speak to you one-on-one -on -one with, with you about what's on our hearts. But we want to praise you, Father, in this time for the possibility of prayer. And so, Father, listen to our praises right now as we thank you for being a God who's so willing to give us yourself in your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you so much for the gift of the Spirit, the gift of your presence that you give us, that we can become like you and, and have your character and your power and your strength. And last but not least, Lord, we, we know we are sinners. Forgive us, Lord, of this. And forgive us, Lord, for, for um, the times we have been indifferent to the pain of our suffering brothers and sisters. And we think of our friends in Ukraine who are struggling, families in subways right now, displaced from their homes. So as a people, we want to pray for the country of Ukraine and we want to pray for the Christian church. And so as a church here and, and if you're at home with someone, could you turn to your neighbor and could the church of God here, this local community of faith, lift up our voices to the God of the universe for our, for our friends and our family in Ukraine. So let's pray together as a church for the people, for the church of Ukraine. Let's do that together right now. Turn to the neighbor next to you and let's pray for the people in the church of Ukraine. Father, thank you for giving us this privilege to unite together despite our differences of preference and beliefs. We can still come together in one mind, praying that the Spirit of God would pour upon us and the Spirit of God would especially, that comfort would especially comfort our friends in Ukraine. So be close to the people and be with us as we continue to pray for the, for the people that are suffering right now. Thank you for united prayer, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would help us continue to walk on that path of being a church, of being a people that puts first things first, that puts you first, that puts praying first. We love you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand to our feet. Our praise team is going to come up. We're going to close us out with this song. We want to stand together. We want the church to rise, to pray, to support to be a blessing to others. So let's pray. Praise team, lead us in this song. Amen. Acts 2 said that when um, the Holy Spirit came down after the apostles heard that wind, felt that wind of God flow through that room, that he fell as uh, in the form of a flame. And that flame burned away all their pride, burned away all their selfishness, burned away, uh, burned away all the, the, the distractions 
uh, of those members. And they just focus on spreading the gospel. They went out of that upper room and just went and actually uh, sp uh, burned the city for Jesus, basically. And so that is a, a, a prayer that we all want uh, in singing the song.
Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Father, as we sung, may we rise together. May we move forward on our knees, praying together unitedly so that we could experience the Spirit of God coming upon us, so that we could have your character and we can do your mission in this world. So Lord, please help us come together and plead for you because we need more of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated, church. Well, we're, we're glad that you came today. We, are, we welcome you every week. We want to welcome you even next week when you come. Those of you watching online, thank you for coming. And remember, we experience the Spirit of God. God wants us to be disciple makers, to share Jesus with others. So be a blessing to others. Be a witness in God's Spirit. God bless you.
One, two. One, two. One, two, testing. One, two, three, testing. Got it? It's all good. Possibly we might need two of them. Yeah, yeah, I have another one. Is she going to present from there then? Is it working? No, we actually to check in the, the mic. Okay. My test. Me chai, me chai. Computer doesn't have an HDMI connection. So I just want to see if there was a, another connector.
Here's Owen. Hello? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon and happy Sabbath. <laughs> welcome for the, uh, I welcome you for the health ministry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon and happy Sabbath. Uh, welcome to the health ministry department and we are pleased and have a pleasure to present to you a small program for uh, our uh, uh, speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Michai Tesali, who has been a cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist at Tinsdale Adventist Hospital for the past, I think, more than 20 years. <laughs> so he will present to us COVID and it's probably side effect with the heart. So as a cardiologist, he knows about this. But uh, if, uh, also we want to present a short uh, a presentation of nutrition or uh, diet regarding hypertension and cardiovascular uh, for the cardiovascular problems. So Anna Irisari, which is our own uh, member too here, uh, she will speak on nutrition. And uh, we want to present that. She's a professor at Dominican University at River Forest. And she's uh, well informed and she is a nutritionist. So before we do this, I would just like to run down the program uh, Angie will give us a prayer, then Anna will present her little lecture, or short, very short ones. Uh, Andrew Maldonado will give us a special number, and uh, Dr. Tesali will give us the presentation. Thank you for coming, and thank you for listening. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Um, God impresses me that uh, we have to open the Bible. And uh, the second uh, Chronicles chapter 7, verses uh, 13 to 15. This is when uh, um, after Solomon dedicated the temple, God appeared to him. And he said, when I shut up the heaven so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague among the people. <clears throat> if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wickedness, wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered at this place. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are just so glad that we could come today and learn about this disease as it affects our heart. We are sinful people, Lord. We are disobedient, and you know our hearts. So we come to you, give us the desire, and create in our hearts that uh, we can connect with you through your words. And uh, Lord, we are dealing with so many uh, chaos in this world. There is war, there is famine, there is this pandemic. And then... Uh, we do not know where, where to turn to, but you have promised in John 16, 33, that Jesus come and that uh, we may have peace in him. And that the uh, Lord, uh, he said that he overcome the world. And we thank you that he overcome the world and here we are. We have the courage and the strength to come to you. 
I ask that you will uh, bless uh, the words coming from the lips of uh, Brother Michai, that we will learn from it, and then we will learn how to trust that you are the one uh, up in heaven looking on each one of us and the world affairs that you are the sovereign God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. It's very hard to speak after we have lunch, so this is gonna be short. And um, first of all, before I start with nutrition, whenever we talk about health, we have to talk about a group of things, right? Rest, what else? Exercise, water, sun, and everything, right? We know all the groups um, that are important, com the important components for lifestyle, to have a better lifestyle. And since February is, we're celebrating the heart health, um, that's what we're talking today about the importance of, we focus more on the diet and also other important things that Dr. Tessali is gonna talk to us this afternoon about how to take care of better our heart. Um, but I want to introduce you, um, Ampelio Mesa. Ampelio Mesa, I invite him to be here today, and yesterday he called me, he has an emergency situation, so he, has, he went to North Carolina, and that's why he's not here with us. But uh, he authorized me to share a little bit his experience. So Ampelio Mesa, he, he's a brother from a Bolingbrook Hispanic Church, and he, when he was 66 years old, he was walking outside with his wife, when he suddenly have a pain in his chest. And he said maybe it was something else and he didn't pay so much attention. So he continued doing um, other activities and the next day he feel the same thing. When he said this is not right, it's something else is going on and he feel, he say he has other symptoms. So he went to see, um, the doctor, and sure enough, they put him, they hospitalized him, and so, and he was about to have a heart attack. And the doctor said, I cannot even do uh, angioplasty, or I, I don't know how you call it, because your arteries are so clogged that we can do that. We need to do an urgent surgery. But there is no much hope for you to say that this is gonna be okay because of your age, because of the whole other situations that he had. Uh, but he decided to go ahead, he said, Let, let's do the surgery. And he prayed, he called his, son, his kids, and um, all the family in church, we started praying for him, and they did the surgery. After the surgery, um, he was in recovery, and he was well, and he decided to make changes in his diet and make changes in his lifestyle. Again, resting and, you know, do exercises and stuff. So he started at the age of 66 and started running marathons or mini marathons. Like marathons is 26, 23, 26 um, miles, but he started with 13 miles, like half marathons and he started going to different states, and he asked, look at all his medals, and look at him. This is his daughter, who also motivated him, but it was another person, and Pelo Mesa was somebody else that I never met before. He was energetic, he was, and now he likes to preach, you know, with his own testimony, how important is to start making changes in his diet, and our diet, and also in everything else. All the components are important. So why I'm bringing this to you is that sometimes we think, oh, we are, all, we are already old to start doing exercise. Who is gonna do marathons when you never did in your life, and if he did at 66 years old, and he's proving us, that means that we have the capacity, we are not different, we are similar to him, right? We may have other health conditions, but we're similar. Um, 
So that gives me a motivation myself, you know, that it's important to start um, not only focus on one thing, it's also resting, exercise, um, and take, going to take some sunlight, and so many other things that we know already, but we need to start practicing. So now we're gonna make, um, I'm just gonna give you five tips, and you guys gonna take home this page, I'm gonna give you at the end of this program, five tips to help in your diet. And I'm not gonna take too much of the time of Dr. Cecily. So the first, the first one is, can you move to the next one? Is choose um, healthier types of fat and cooking metals, okay? So there's always grilling, there's always steaming, saute, or put it in the, um, on the oven, and there is, there's always benefits to change our recipes instead of frying, right? Now I hear that a lot of the women in, in the Filipino churches now they have the air fryer. So that's a good idea, right? So instead of doing that, it's always get, it's better because we're reducing the fat intake, you know, especially saturated fat. Um, another, another component that is so important is to start including more omega-3s. So we hear um, a lot of omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, omega we can talk about it in, in another time, but when I focus on omega-3, it has many benefits to help on our heart health, you know, and has polyunsaturated fats that help us to reduce triglycerides and other uh, saturated fats from our, from our arteries. So what is saturated fat? We always talk about saturated fat. Very, very basic, very simple. It's a solid fat. If you make a chicken soup, and when it gets cold, you know that layer that you see on top, the thick one, that's a saturated fat, something that is solid, versus oils, you know, oils is something liquid. So when we incorporate more, for example, olive oil or something to our cooks or to um, other type of oils, that's better than saturated fat. And I don't like to uh, use uh, some substitutes like trans fats or other things. Those, those can be worse. If you're gonna use saturated fats or so, small amount. Or if you're gonna use oils, we can talk about something else because they're all different, olive, different oils that have different uh, smoke point, right? Some they can burn faster than others. But the key here, the message is less fry and if you use low oils and very low heat, right? So that's best. And if you wanna choose something better for your heart, well, so far, there's so many controversies, but so far we know olive oil can be our best, one of our best um, choices, or canola oil, when, we, when it comes to cooking. Um, can we change to another? So the next tip, quick, uh, we already talked about omega-3s, um, especially in, from fish, but if you're a vegetarian, there is also another um, sources of omega-3, which is the, um, from algae. algae. Alga, something say like that. Algium, uh huh. So there's some um, pills that you can take if you if you don't want to take from fish, and if you do fish uh, or select fish, at least two portions per week. Uh, the third one is fiber. Adding fiber to our to our diet is so important, you know. Um, but important if you add fiber to your diet, it's so important to include water water. So there are a lot of people who suffer from constipation and decided to take more fiber and it gets worse. And why? Because they, we don't include water. Those two go together. And walking. If we don't do that, um, if you increase your fiber, if you don't combine with water and walk, then you're going to continue with worse problems. Okay? And that helps a lot in our, um, with our, our heart health. Mm -hmm. The next one is saturated fat. I already mentioned saturated fat. It comes, saturated fat not only comes from animal products, but also from plants. But the, the thing is that when it comes from plants, well, for example, coconut oil or peanut butter, that's a saturated fat also. But so not because it's plant, we can eat whatever we want, the amount. We're still going to work with portion, right? If I'm gonna take, um, when I eat peanut butter, for example, if you look at your little, your finger here, like two of those, that's your portion, okay? 
And if it's same thing with coconut oil, it's good, it's healthy. There are other controversies about coconut oil, but you still, moderation. Moderation is important. There's other nutrients, other things that we can get from coconut oil. Um, you can still use that, but in a small amount. But when it comes from animal products, because they come other things together, like cholesterol and other things, that's what we're saying. Go with less portion or go more plant-based. Plant-based means more fruits, vegetables or so, and less amount of um, meats through, you know, throughout the week. That's plant-based. And Or if you want to practice vegetarianism or veganism, that's even a good choice. Sometimes you can choose once a day, once a week to be, say, I want to practice today once a week or twice a week to be vegan. So that's also a good choice, right? And the last one is reduce salt. Um, when, you come, when you see the little grain of salt, 40% of that grain is sodium, okay? So not all salt is sodium, but salt, 40% of that is sodium. And we want to control that. I don't... Whenever the doctors say, eat 23,000, um, 2,300 milligrams of sodium, I don't know what is that. I don't measure, I don't know, I just eat, right? And I imagine you don't know how much milligrams or grams of sodium you ate today. We don't know. The key here is, let's start practicing. For example, don't bring in the salt on the table. Or maybe um, put in less salt when I'm cooking or put some more lime or herbs and other things that can help me to start um, to put more sodium into or more salt into your diet. So some people say, well, I choose now sea salt or I choose Himalayan salt. Well, the news is all of them are have the similar amount of sodium. Some of them a little less, but not so much. They're similar. But what is good about that is the way they they get or they grab the sodium, they, con they have other minerals or other nutrients, it's less processed. So that's the good thing about choosing Himalayan salt or sea salt. But when it comes to sodium, it's pretty much similar. So the key again is limit and reduce or no adding sodium. So all those practices that we have, I can talk in depth about each of this, but it's not my time, it's not my topic right now, but if we practice, and I know we all of us, we know this, but sometimes we don't practice, and that's the thing. So small goals. Think about out of these five, which, are, which one you want to work this week. And maybe next week we can start with something else. So today when you leave here, think about, do I'm going to work on my fats, a little bit less sodium, or maybe I'm going to start thinking about introducing more omegas to my, omega-3 to my diet. I don't know. But... Whatever you do, it will be a good help to have a better heart, right? Heart health. And I remember, not only diet, it's also exercise. It's also rest. It's also trusting God and so many other points that we already know. Okay, thank you so much. At the end, um, don't leave with your page with a copy that I have for you. And now it's time for Dr. Tessali. Oh, Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's, it's a pleasure for me to uh, minister with you guys, to you guys. Um, it's just a really interesting time to be alive, huh? So many things going on. The more that, that you look, you look at the news and you talk to people on the street, it can be pretty disheartening. But um, I just want to give everyone hope here that Jesus... He's coming again. Not only is he coming again, he's coming soon. And I want to ask this question to everyone here is, whose kingdom are we living for? Are we living for this earthly kingdom, this physical kingdom? Or are we living for this, the, the heavenly kingdom? So with this song, this old song, just my prayer that uh, you'll be encouraged by these words. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. 
our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and arm with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confine, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battles. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. His kingdom is forever and much for that song. That's awesome with a cappella. <laughs> so beautiful. Um, I'm going to see if we can uh, show this. Hopefully it will come up. You know, I would recommend that those of you who are in the back there just kind of come in and fill in over here because you're really going to want to see this, you know, with some of the video stuff that I have to show. Because back there, you're not going to be able to see anything. Let's see if I can turn this back on. What's up? Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to mention a couple of things here with the, um, what Anna was talking about with these healthy eating tips. This is, that talk was probably more important than what you're going to hear here about COVID <laughs> in terms of heart health because really those are the lifestyle changes that we need to make. And I can tell you that these lifestyle changes are very, very difficult to implement, you know, in terms of what you're supposed to eat, what you're not supposed to eat. You know, one of the questions, and a lot of things, a lot of times we don't know exactly what it is. You know, people say two to three grams of sodium. We don't know what that is. And unless you actually do it, you'll never understand what two to three grams of sodium is. But I've actually tried to do two to three grams of sodium. So the way that I would summarize how to share with you how much two grams of sodium is, if you had lunch today and you ate and you said that tasted pretty good, you ate more than two grams of sodium today. If you tasted it and you said, ooh, that, this doesn't taste too good, it's kind of bland, 
you probably ate less than two grams of sodium. If you have more, I, I've had a two gram sodium, you, it doesn't have any taste whatsoever. So it's very, very difficult to do those kinds of things. But step by step, and the other thing that I can share with you as well too is, this is just one of those things that um, when you have life difficult decisions, you turn to God. You know, you, you, you recognize that you have absolutely no control over what you are doing and give it all to God. Um, discussion with him and prayer also. So that's just to start out. But I'm going to focus today on COVID and the heart. And I feel like I'm speaking during prime time when people are sleepy. Because <laughs> I am the most sleepy right now, about 2 to 3 o'clock um, in the afternoon. Even at work, I'm the most sleepy. So I'm going to try my best to keep you guys awake. And hopefully, at the end of this talk, you will have learned something about COVID. You can imagine our grandkids that were not part of this, our future grandkids who will be part of it. The, they're not going to know exactly how it, what it is that we went through. Um, but you have all gone through this. You're going to hear a lot of the things that you've heard on the news, a lot of things that you live even now in your daily lives. Um, and hopefully I can share with you some a little bit of medical information. I tried to make it so that it's not too complicated and not putting any, everybody asleep. So I have lots of nice pictures in here that I'll, I'll share with you. This first picture here, as you can see, you, you classically see this coronavirus, this virus on a lot of um, you know, media publications. And this is actually a picture of what the coronavirus actually looks like. And it is um, sort of a round membrane type structure, and then on the surface of it are these things that come out, and they call those the spike proteins. And those spike proteins are what make this thing here unique to, in, in the way that it looks. So, you know, coronaviruses have been around for a long time. Um, let's see if I can get this thing to go. Coronaviruses have been around for a long time. So when I initially heard about coronavirus, I said, what, what are they talking about? This has like been in kids, you know, cold viruses all the time. Why is this such a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because back in February of 2020, um, the World Health Organization discovered that this COVID-19, and by the way, this COVID comes from coronavirus disease, right? COVID, coronavirus disease 19. 2019, <laughs> right? So COVID-19. And the virus causes COVID, the virus that causes COVID-19 is designated, you guys have heard of SARS in the, in the past. So SARS here is S-A-R-S, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, COVID-2. So that's what SARS-CoV-2, you'll hear this a lot too. That's kind of like the technical name of what the COVID is all about. And some history behind it. Um, well, first of all, this is why do they call it the coronavirus? This is just a graphic of a crown, right? Corona, the crown. And, and that's what this structure kind of looks like is that there are a bunch of crowns on it. That's how, the, how, that's how it got its name is coronavirus. So it originated, they discovered this in Wuhan, China. Um, it was in a market in China by this Hubei province, and I just put a, a, a map here for those of you who are not as familiar, but China down here, I think Philippines, is Philippines down there? Or over here? Or down, right? Down and over here. <laughs> this one. There you go. Well, anyway, it's Wuhan. This is the province where they found this thing. And what, the way that they first discovered it in 2019 was that there were these cluster of pneumonias that came about. It caused pneumonia. And um, it spread rapidly, as you know, and it caused a uh, global pandemic. And this is actually um, a picture of the city of Wuhan. So most of you are familiar with these already, but I'll mention them to you because this is official. Uh, symptoms that you have had if you've had COVID. Um, I'll walk back and forth here. 50% of people have a cough. 43% have a fever. Fever is greater than 100.4. Myalgias, so muscle aches or headaches. Um, dyspnea, so you sort of have this sensation that you can't get a full breath, you can't take a full breath. You have a sore throat in 20% of the cases and diarrhea. One of the very first cases that I saw in the hospital was a gentleman that came in with diarrhea and we were focused on his stomach. And I saw him in the morning thinking, 
this guy's got some kind of a GI thing. He probably ate some bad food. But by that afternoon, he was intubated, and then he was dead the next day. Turned out to be COVID, but diarrhea. So I'm like, oh my goodness. Uh, nausea and vomiting, 12%, and a loss of smell, taste. You, you guys have heard this, right? Loss of smell, taste, abdominal pain. That actually accounts for less than 10%. Um, but if you have it, and you have all of these other symptoms, that kind of points it in the direction of possible COVID. This is just a, a, a chart. A lot of this information that, we, um, that I'm using here is from, you know, doctors use a guide called Up to Date. So I want to really give credit to Up to Date. It is, it, 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 it's, it's a medical um, kind of a, I don't know what you would call it, like a, uh, like a, like a menu or <laughs> some kind of a, a medical cookbook that we go to that has the most up to date research on all topics. So I always go to COVID to get the, I mean COVID, to, I always go to uh, up to date to get the most um, up to date uh, information. So everything that I'm presenting here today is from that source. This is what it looks like. Coronavirus, it's got a couple of features here. Um, you see in the middle of this thing is the RNA protein. And the RNA protein basically is designed to create those things that are on the surface. Those, those spike proteins that are right on the surface. And then I'll show you why these, spike pro what, you know, why these are so important and why um, uh, this is so unique to this virus. And then the lipid membrane is what surrounds the structure. That's what, that's how it's, that, that's what it looks like. This is just a technical picture of the actual sequence of, of DNA that they um, isolated to find out how this spike protein is characterized. And this is important because, amazing, they were able to get this sequence into the vaccine so that the vaccine can program your body to produce this protein, this spike protein. So it's not the spike protein that causes the issues, and I'll show you that later. But it's very complicated, just very amazing how they actually did it. So my talk basically today is to focus in on some of the heart manifestations of, um, of COVID. And so I wanted to mention some of these to you here. This by far is nowhere near complete in terms of our knowledge of knowing what happens. Every day I'm learning about what happens with patients who have COVID and what happens to their hearts. This is all new. I mean, you see stuff that happens, and then people will come to the office and say, hey, doc, do you think this could have been caused by COVID? And you kind of scratch your head like, well, I don't know. I never heard of that before, but it, that, but, but it could be. But then when you start to see trends, and then doctors report these symptoms to a, a database, and then you start to see groupings of these things, then that's how these chapters are written. You know, you know what? There's like a bunch of people that are complaining of palpitations, you know, like their hearts beating extra heartbeats. I've seen that very, very commonly. I've seen patients who have had weakened heart muscles. So myocarditis, where the heart function actually diminishes. There's a recent study in one of the ECHO journals that showed that there is indeed a dilation of the heart and also a decrease in function. So hypoxic injury, that means that there's not enough oxygen getting to the heart muscle, so that's how it gets injured. There's an entity called stress cardiomyopathy. This is a reversible weakness of the heart. So you get COVID, it's very stressful on the body, the heart muscle gets weak, doesn't squeeze very well, but then is able to turn around on its own. So that's one entity also. The other thing that we see is ischemia, uh, ischemic injury caused by microvascular damage. So what does that mean? The heart is supplied by blood through the arteries. And these arteries are lined by cells. And you know, when you get this COVID thing, it goes and it messes up your cells that line the arteries. It's the epithelial cells, specifically. So think about those of you who are in science, now it's a little bit more technical, but where are epithelial cells? The skin, it's everywhere. <laughs> you have epithelial cells in every single organ. So if it affects the blood vessels, if it affects the lung epithelial cells, this is why you have all these patchy looking pneumonias. It, this, these epithelial cells are supposed to keep fluids in their respective chambers. If you disrupt those cells, stuff leaks out. And then all of a sudden you can't oxygenate because you're, the cells in the lungs are all messed up because of this um, uh, uh, toxic effect of the coronavirus. Right heart strain, which is 
you, um, uh, what we found is that this coronavirus not only affects the epithelial cells, but it also affects the blood flow within the body. So the blood tends to be thicker. You know, they somehow form blood clots. You remember that Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine, they had a higher number of blood clots from this thing. Um, so blood clots can cause pressures to increase on the right side of the heart, and then you can't breathe, and that's what this thing is called here, this core pulmonale, very, very difficult to treat. Um, and then this last thing here, which is probably the scariest thing, is this thing called systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And what happens is that when this coronavirus goes into the bloodstream, your body sees this as a foreign body, and then it just secretes all of these inflammatory products. In order to fight this thing, you know, in order to fight off the virus, but instead it causes damage to the whole body. I mean, literally the whole body can shut down from this thing here. Systemic inflammatory response syndrome. There's also a version of this in children. And I've actually seen young patients come in and have that full-blown, you know, systemic response this systemic inflammatory response syndrome. I'd never heard of it before in kids until I spoke with my infectious disease colleagues and they said that's what this is, where every single organ just shuts down after you get coronavirus. So those are kind of the manifestations of heart. This is probably an electron microscope picture of the coronavirus, so remember those renditions that you're seeing? That's what it looks like. Circular, and it's got those spikes on the surface and sort of kind of like it surrounds the whole thing, looks like a crown, but that's what that looks like. Other cardiac manifestations. So there are patients who have coronavirus that don't have to have symptoms. They come in the hospital and they have these abnormal findings, you know, like the, the ultrasound of the heart shows a weakened heart muscle, but they feel fine. Or they get blood tests done, such as a troponin level. For those of you who are in medicine, this troponin level is a uh, marker uh, in the bloodstream for heart attack. But it's not a heart attack. It's just elevated because this thing is like irritating the heart muscle and causing it to secrete it. So, but no symptoms, you know, but you have these abnormal tests. Um, some have symptomatic heart disease, and I mentioned that earlier. If you have a failing heart to the point where it's not able to pump blood through, if you have heart shock, cardiogenic shock, um, or if you have a heart attack where the, um, the clot, the blood clot actually fills up those arteries, then you have a heart attack <laughs> and then that's it and then you die. So, <laughs> um, I mean, I deal with the patients who come in with those clots and actually during the COVID pandemic when it was going through the first phase there. I mean, doing an angiogram on those patients was very, very scary because everybody had to gown up and put on masks and you couldn't see anything because everything was all foggy. <laughs> and you're trying to do sort of intricate work and in trying to save these patients. And there was a patient that we actually took to the, to the angiogram lab and we were able to fix his artery. You know, we deterred the heart attack. The problem is, what about the rest? So now the heart's functioning, but then the guy died of a pneumonia. You know, so you, you do all of these things, but you can't fix the whole system, like the whole body. So um, these are just some of the things that we found. Patients also come in with cardiac arrest, and that's like the scariest thing to have to code somebody who has coronavirus. Um, this is a very busy slide, but I'm going to go through it slowly here, step by step, to see why is it, how is it that this coronavirus does its damage? How does a virus get into your body and mess you up? How does it do it? It does it by a couple of mechanisms. The first thing is direct viral toxicity. I told you earlier about the epithelial, epithelial cells. On the surface of the epithelial cells, they got these ACE receptors. They're just called ACE receptors. This stuff goes and binds onto those receptors and it makes these cells dysfunctional. So now you have a nice barrier, right, in the lungs that separates, you know, your, your air pockets from your blood and from your lymphs, you know, everything. And now all of a sudden there's a disruption in that barrier. Imagine if you had a, a disruption in the barrier of your skin. Same thing, right? You, you, you'll ooze out fluid. If you have a disruption in any of the, you know, barriers within the eye, I mean, you secrete all this fluid. This is what happens in the lungs when you get COVID pneumonia. 
is that it messes up these endothelial cells, and they're everywhere. The other thing that the way this virus messes you up is inf inflammation. All these things here are inflammatory markers that they've isolated from the bloodstream. Those inflammatory markers, are, these inflammatory things are supposed to get rid of bad things in your body. And they do. If you have a bacterial infection and you secrete this stuff here, it kills a bacteria. It kills good stuff too <laughs> while it does it. And the problem is, is that when this thing gets to this thing called a cytokine storm, which means all of these things come out overwhelmingly, then your body gets hurt by it as well. And then that's how people get overwhelmingly sick. And that's how the virus affects the body. Here's the other thing that we just mentioned, right? Va thrombosis and vasculitis. So it causes the blood to be thicker. It causes the blood to form clots. And if you get clots with, I mean, your body needs blood. If you have a clot going to the heart, you have a heart attack. You have clots going to the lungs, you have a pulmonary embolism. You have a clot going up to the brain, you have a stroke. You don't want clots anywhere in your body. And the virus causes clot formation. So that's another way that it hurts you. This last thing here, very, very complicated, but they're learning what's happening with this is somehow it triggers an autoimmune response. Autoimmune response, what does that mean? It means that your body produces antibodies to try to go after this thing. And it's, these antibodies are being formed, instead of going after these things, it's going also after your native tissue as well. No good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just chaos, right? It's just chaos whenever you have this, um, this infection go on. Um, so that's what causes these things. Now you can understand how it can cause a heart attack. Now you can understand why it causes the heart muscle not to squeeze so well because you're disrupting all of the blood supply and the membranes. You can also see why there is an inflammation around the heart. Viral myocarditis is an inflammation. Now you know why there's inflammation around there. It's because it's, it's causing it. And um, autoimmune myocarditis. Um, whenever you have your heart arteries and the heart muscle affected by anything, you can start to have irregular heartbeats. And so you see things such as atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Probably the most common thing that I've heard people say, I don't know if any of you have, I don't know if it's soon enough to ask people here if you've had COVID. <laughs> but those of you who have had COVID or have experienced, did you ever have feelings like skipped heartbeats? Like your heart, yeah, was, he, he, he felt that. That's common actually. I've even had people have the vaccine, and after the vaccine, they have palpitations. Like, they've never had palpitations before. And then all of a sudden, after the vaccine, they, they feel palpitations. So it does have an effect on the heart. Um, so that's why these things happen. The heart gets kind of irritated, and then you have these extra beats. The good thing about it is that, for example, the lady that came to my office who had these palpitations, they usually go away with the vaccine. If you've actually had the COVID itself, we're not sure yet how long the effects are. And that kind of leads down to these, which I'll talk to you a little bit later, but the time course of what happens after you get COVID. There's this thing that they're discovering very, very recently that they call long COVID syndrome. So after you get it, <laughs> uh, after a period of time, you know, remember this one to two weeks? You guys are familiar with this because that's your quarantine period. <laughs> this is the most active time period. But then after week two, three, you start to feel better and then there is this time frame, two to four weeks, where you, you, some people still have symptoms. They, they just feel tired. They still can't get a full breath. I mean, it's more exaggerated in some people than others. Um, but, you know, they just can't get back to feeling normal, and they still feel out of breath. And this kind of goes all the way up. By definition, if you still have this by week number 12, you have this long COVID or post-COVID syndrome. And this is another graph here that shows kind of the, the, the kind of the oscillating time frame of what happens when you get this thing. In the beginning when you get this, you know, you, you kind of recover, right? You get all your symptoms and you, you recover. And then it's like, <laughs> you still don't feel very well. And then you kind of come back up. Some people get up here and they get up to baseline. They go back to the way they normally felt. Some people come up and they not quite the same as what they used to be. You know, they have this incomplete recovery. And then as they're puttering along here, it relapses again, and you start having these symptoms again. We are just learning about this part. All we know is that it does affect us and the way we function. I mean, mental health impairment, inability to return to work, reduced exercise tolerance, risk of obesity, 
So that's kind of a busy slide, I know, but I hope I, I kind of touched on all of these important parts here. So how do we prevent COVID from happening? How do we prevent COVID from happening? A lot of you already know the, these things, right? But I'll officially talk about it <laughs> and kind of tell you the science behind why we do this. It's kind of weird that we have to actually explain this part, uh, washing hands and, and things like that. But anyway, diligent hand washing. These are official recommendations from education sources, okay? Diligent washing hands, particularly after touching a surface in public. The use of hand sanitizer of at least 60% alcohol is reasonable to use. And how did they figure that one out? So what they did was they took mucus specimens that had virus, the COVID virus on it. And then they put it on the skin of like from autopsy patients. <laughs> they put on the skin and they measured that these things, this COVID thing was still active, active and viable up to nine hours after it was on human skin. Nine hours, okay? And then what they did was they used 80% alcohol and within 15 minutes, no activity. So when you use the hand sanitizer stuff, there's not, you, you get rid of it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's gone. So that's, that's how we got that uh, information. Um, another picture of how it looks. So by the time you're done here, you can see the membrane. And then on the surface, the crown, kind of all these kind of spikes on here. And inside is all of the RNA virus. That's, that's, what's, produ that's what's programming these spike things to come out and make it characteristic. Another thing, again, kind of common sense, but in the media every single day and also argued <laughs> in the media and amongst us in church and in groups and in schools regarding face masks and regarding all this stuff. I'm not here to tell anybody here today that you should wear a mask. I'm not here to tell anybody here today that you should get vaccinated. I'm gonna share medical information with you and you guys decide. Respiratory hygiene. If you sneeze, you cover your mouth. Some people would agree with that. <laughs> Funny to say that some people may not agree with that. Um, sneezing, by the way, when you cover, I still see people covering with their hands, so you kind of don't want to cover with your hands, right? You want to kind of cover with your elbow so that it's out of the way so you're not transmitting it with your hands later. Um, avoid touching the face, particularly the eyes, nose, and mouth. While I was doing this review, the one thing that I found very interesting is that the American Society of Ophthalmology recommended that you don't wear contacts. And I wear contacts, <laughs> but I just read this and I'm like, they actually recommended during the time of COVID not to wear contacts because you're touching your eyes and you people that have contact, you do tend to rub and touch your eyes more. And that's a direct route where this virus can get transmitted. Ensure adequate ventilation in indoor spaces. That makes sense too. Make sure there's circulation so that those things, those particles aren't getting inhaled. Opening the windows and doors, placing fans, um, windows to exhaust air to, um, to the outside, running the air conditioning continuously, using portable high efficiency HEPA filters. You ever wonder how small this thing is? I found this figure very interesting. This is a hair like a hair, somebody's hair. This, and this is like, you, you chop off a piece of hair. This is a piece of hair. And this is about 80 to one, what is this? 50 to 180 micrometers. This is a fine beach sand, a grain of sand, okay? It's about 60 micro micrometers. White blood cells are 25 micrometers. This grain of pollen is 15. And this dust particles, Dust particles, right? Got dust particles everywhere. You can't really see them. You got a whole bunch of them. Uh, but they are about the size of 10 micrometers. And then red blood cells that are going through your body, these little red blood cells are about 7 to 8 micrometers. Respiratory droplets, like if you, you know, like spit, <laughs> they can be as small as 5 to 10. This is another smaller dust particle, 2.5, 2.5 micrometers. You know those filters, how they have those grades of how much it filters? That's how, that's how fine those filters are that it blocks a 2.5 micrometer dust particle. Uh, bacteria in the blood is 1.3 micrometers, 1.3 micrometers. 
Um, smoke, wildfire smoke is 0.4 to 0.7. And finally, the coronavirus, 0.5, sorry, 0.1 to 0.5 micrometers. That's small. That's really small. Let's take a look at what exactly that looks like, actually. These things here, they're small. I mean, as I'm talking here, stuff's coming out. <laughs> you can't see them because they're so small. You saw how, how big the respiratory particles were. But this shows a line of if somebody sneezes, and when I sneeze, I sneeze pretty strong. <laughs> it shoots really far. The, this distance here is 26 feet. 26 feet. It's crazy. Hold on a second here. Remember we were talking about like 2 to 3 grams of sodium? We don't know what that is. 26 feet. I don't know how much 26 feet is, actually. Here. Can you, Peter, can you grab this? This is a 25-foot measuring tape. I've never pulled this all the way out. So 25 feet is pretty Go, go back over there. Hold on. What's this up to? I don't, just don't let it go. Um, 21, 22, 23, 24. That's it. It says attention. Stop. So 25. So if I sneeze, stuff can get all the way to Peter there. It's crazy. Thank you. Here, just slowly. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy how far these things go. Now, obviously, whenever you, you're talking or you're spitting, or, I mean, it, it comes pretty close here. And usually it drops within six feet. Most of the stuff drops six feet in front. That's where we get this six feet distancing from. Right? We say stay six feet at least away. That's why, because this stuff goes out six feet. Let's put this in my pocket. So I wanted to show you this. This is a really cool video. That's why I want you, wanted you guys to see the, um, come up front. Oh, that wasn't it. There we go. Can you see that? So these are spit particles. <laughs> this is about 20 inches away from somebody's mouth. Here, Auntie, I'm trying to hold that. 20 inches. 20 inches right there. OK, so if I'm here, you're going to get stuff. <laughs> 20 inches. So then they kind of show it you know, a little bit further um, out. This is uh, 43 inches. That's 43 inches. Still kind of close to you there. So you can still touch. Obviously, it's most right here. If I were to sneeze, it's still going to be right in front of me. But it still can get out there to 43 inches. And I think the last one here shows that super sneeze. Do you guys sneeze where you kind of hold it in, or do you sneeze and just let it all out? <laughs> At least in church, you try not to do that, right? There, there's that full sneeze. It can get out that far, and I believe it if you really push that hard. This is also a very cool video, too. This actually shows the different types of face masks. The first, the first series of what you're going to see here is... It took me, I watched this like 10 times. It's so cool. This here is like with nothing on your face, no mask. This here is with one layer of cloth mask. This is with two layers of a cloth mask. And this is with a surgical mask. Okay? Let's just take a look. So in, in this first video, the guy counts one, two, three. When do you think you spit the most? Two. <laughs> Three, four, watch. So this is counting. Just keep an eye on that first one. And they're counting one. And watch when he says two. One, two, <laughs> three. Three is pretty bad too, actually. Four. You know, I can actually see my own spit. Now that I'm paying attention, even me saying it, I can see it. Here's six. 
Oh, six is pretty bad too. Seven. But you see, I mean, this thing is blocking it. This is blocking it too. Uh, this is not blocking it at all. Nine. And then I thought 10 would be more, but I guess he was saying 10 without emphasizing the T because it's not really, nothing's coming out there. This is when somebody's coughing. You're going to think differently about somebody who's coughing next to you. Look at that. We kind of know this, though. Have you ever seen those videos online where somebody comes up to them and they start playing this trick where they go behind somebody's back and they go, <coughs> and they spray them in the back? It's actually very irritating. <laughs> but imagine you being in the store and somebody came up to you and went, <coughs> and then sprayed. You'd be pretty upset that they were doing that. But that's how it is there. Here's a sneeze. So this is still, it's still coming out. There's still something here with the surgical mask, but it certainly is definitely mitigated with, you know, with a mask. I mean, something, again, it's very funny that I would have to tell everybody here that wearing a mask actually helps with not spraying your spit. I don't know why that's an argument, but, there, but it is an argument because people are saying yes or no to mask wearing. So, well, it's, it's, it's your, like I said, I'm not here to tell anybody that, you know, whether or not you should wear a mask. I'm not making any political statement, but um, I'm here to share this medical information with you, and it's your choice. This is what this coronavirus looks like. Another picture of it. This long COVID, um, post-COVID syndrome, they've kind of tabulated some of the results of what some of the symptoms are, and that is fatigue, but it's weird because I always feel fatigued. Dyspnea, up to 71%, so not being able to catch a full breath, still being short of breath. Ca uh, chest pain or tightness, I've had that in some of my patients, and then cough that persists. And then less common, um, less common persistent physical symptoms are where you can't where you can't smell. I've had patients who still can't smell. For those of you who've had COVID, have you lost your sense of smell at all? I don't know, did you lose your sense of smell? Uh, yes. You did? About two weeks. Okay, so sometimes this persists. Dizziness, insomnia, diarrhea. This is what I was talking to you about in terms of that post-COVID thing or whatever. First week, second week time frame, third, fourth, and this is where we all are at right now, a lot of us. And then this is kind of the recovery and relapse phase here. So um, I, wanted to do, I wanted to do something here, and I need a volunteer. I wanna see if, let's see, who can, who can I ask to be a volunteer? <laughs> I need somebody to, yeah, maybe, how about Jason? <laughs> I'm not gonna do anything. <laughs> no, no, so, all right, 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 here, you know, just, just, um, I just wanted to, I wanna try something here. This is, so just, if you can just stand right there, remember we were talking about like six feet. So what I'm gonna try to test here is, if I can, if I spray this, this is, this is COVID vaccine, this is like COVID laced stuff. So <laughs> I wanna see if you can feel this at all on your face, but you have a choice. You want me to wear a mat? You want me to cover this when I do this or not? <laughs> Which would you rather? Oh. I'll do it either one. Please. You really would want me to, huh? Okay, so <laughs> it's not 100%, is it? It's not 100%, it's gonna come out the side. But why would he want me to do this? Why would he want me to wear a mask, seriously? <laughs> I mean, is this, I'm protecting you, I'm protecting, like you can't wear a mask. <laughs> This is, this is actually um, Windex. I, I, I sterilize this. <laughs> and this is like purified water. <laughs> so. Let 
the most effective means to prevent post-COVID conditions? What do you think the most effective means to prevent post-COVID things are? <laughs> not get COVID. How do you not get COVID? What we, what, 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 what we just talked about. Yes. Oh, sorry. I said, how do you not get COVID? You, 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 you try all the things that we talked about here. You can do vitamin D3 too. There's a lot of things we can talk about. There's like a whole list of things you can do that can help with this. I'm a big vitamin C person <laughs> and also a zinc person as well. But there's no, there's like no randomized study that actually proves this. You talk to any doctor and they'll look at you weird. I use the zinc and I swear by it. Some people say, you know, there are no studies that help. All I can say is if you do the zinc, if you do your vitamin D, you do your vitamin C, it doesn't hurt. However, if you don't wear a mask, it might hurt. The second one, it is likely that any measure that decreases the incidence of severity of the acute infection will in turn decrease the incidence and severity of post-COVID. That makes sense. I'll say that again. If you do anything that decreases your chances of getting COVID or decrease the symptoms of COVID, then the chances of you having the post-COVID is going to be less. So how do you decrease that? Well, vaccination. Vaccination actually decreases the symptoms. And I'm going to show you a slide here as to why the vaccination works. Why is it that it decreases the symptoms? It's very, it's very, it's very amazing when you look at the science behind this. Um, this last thing here, a case control study found that both symptom intensity in the first week of illness and persistent symptoms as defined by symptoms at 28 weeks were significantly less common among those who developed post-vaccination SARS infection compared to unvaccinated cases. So it's just less. It's not none. It's less, less symptoms. So you want less of all of that. This is a statement from all of the medical guidelines and journals. Vaccines to prevent SARS-CoV-2 infection are considered the most promising approach for curbing the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not telling you to get a vaccine. I'm just showing you the medical information and then you decide on what you should do. But this is how it works, by the way. It's very ingenious. The vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. So what it does is that when you get injected with this stuff, it gets incorporated into the muscles. Most of us had it in our deltoid, in our, in our you know, shoulder muscle here. That muscle cell takes up this messenger RNA. And the, your muscle produces a spike protein. So that's how it works. The, the cell sees this and says, it's programmed to create a spike protein. Why do we want to create a spike protein? Is that, isn't that going to kill us? The spike protein is seen by your body and taken up by these B cells. It's just how your body fights foreign bodies. It takes it up because it's like, oh, this shouldn't be here. But when it takes it up, it doesn't cause all that stuff that you saw earlier where it actually is toxic to the cells. It doesn't stimulate a flood of inflammatory markers. What it does is these B cells produce these guys, these neutralizing antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. So check this out. If you have neutralizing antibodies and you get infected with COVID, this is a COVID, these neutralizing antibodies attach onto the COVID. Right? That's what this thing was programmed it to do. It, it, it latches onto here, and that thing, that virus, cannot attach onto you. It's blocked because of these neutralizing antibodies. It won't attach to the ACE receptor, so it doesn't go into the cell. Obviously, it's not 100% because people still have symptoms if you get COVID, but it sure makes a difference. Look at on this other side here. If COVID gets into your body and you don't have that neutralizing antibody, it attaches on to this ACE2 receptor, and now your body is going to start to create all this havoc um, because of the COVID uh, virus. Isn't that cool? I thought that was pretty cool. I never knew that. <laughs> that that's, that's how this worked on a cellular level, is that they produce these um, uh, neutralizing antibodies. I always thought, man, why would, why would I want to get injected with the virus? 
you're not getting injected with a virus. It's not a live attenuated virus. It is a messenger RNA. And once this thing happens, once it goes into here and your cells are programmed to produce this spike thing, this stuff just dissolves. It just goes away in, in the body. It just gets eaten up and it just goes away. So, so that's, what that, that's how that vaccine thing works. So I hope that you guys learned a little bit of something with the, the COVID. You learned some of the, you know, the, the acronyms here of what, how we got the COVID name and why it's COVID-19 from 2019. You guys will remember that. And um, also the SARS, which is, a, a, you know, a, acute respiratory viral syndrome. Um, and so that is a summary of COVID and the heart. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Any, any questions at all? We have questions. Yeah. They, they, they only recommend what? One, one meter? Okay, so I don't know how much a meter is in compared to six feet. So half. So in the, school, in, the, in the schools, by the way, they have actually decreased that number to three feet. Okay, so let's set aside how we're trying to live from the science, okay? If you had COVID, I'd wanna be in another room. I don't wanna be six feet or even three feet near you, but we have to live. So the school system, in order to make that possible, they're saying, well, maybe we can just be three feet away from each other. It's a compromise. So that's the reason. There's no science behind three, Three feet is, you, you saw the spit thing. <laughs> I mean, if you're three feet, you're going to be closer. You have more of a chance. But we're trying to just accommodate. We're trying to live also instead of being in a bubble. I think that's the answer. Any other questions? Yes. So that's, so that's a medical question. He asked... Is it okay to take ACE inhibitors? So for those of you who don't know, ACE inhibitors are blood pressure medications, and they work by attaching onto the ACE receptor in your body and vasodilates. So there was initial concern about that. They were like, well, you know what? Maybe we should stop using the ACE inhibitor because it's attaching onto these receptors. It might make you worse. And then they said, well, wait a second. If it's attaching onto a receptor, maybe it'll help block the virus from attaching, maybe it's better. Maybe everybody should be on an ACE inhibitor. There are no studies that support either way. <laughs> either way. If you're on an ACE inhibitor, don't be afraid. Keep taking your ACE inhibitor. It's not going to hurt or harm you. It'll continue to treat your blood pressure. So another question. Yeah. Oh. Say again. Fermented. Is it okay to take NATO and ATTO to I'm prevent uh, clot formation? I don't even know what natto is. <laughs> so, uh, fermented, soybeans. fermented soybeans. Yes. If somehow that thins out your blood, if somehow it is an, an anticoagulant, it thins out your blood, then probably it will help. You know, whenever you take, um, like, like, you know, supposedly omega-3s, they studied that, and it's supposed to actually sort of make your blood less thick. I mean, anything that's going to make your blood less thick will probably help with, with clot formation. I don't know if that's been officially studied. Yeah. So again, you could use that. The recommendation here in the United States is actually people are, um, they actually put people on anticoagulation now. They put them on blood thinners such as Coumadin or Eliquis to thin out their blood. And when you see this happen, the blood clots going to the lungs, you want your blood to be thinned. I mean, you do not want your blood to be thick at all because if that happens, then you die. Um, if, if that stuff truly works in terms of thinning the blood to a level where you can't form clots, that's beautiful. Is it, it's from plants? It's, oh, it's, it's from soy. What's that? It dissolves. It dissolves it. Well, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Is there a study on uh, the rel relative incidence of myocarditis, myocarditis between the vaccine and the disease? See, this is the problem with presenting with doctors in the audience. <laughs> I had to look this all up in anticipation for a doctor asking me that question. The incidence of actually somebody getting a shot 
you know, a vaccine, but his question was, what's the chances or what, are the, what is the incidence if you get a, a, a vaccine that you're gonna get myocarditis? That's, hit, you know, that, that's like big news on the headlines. The media has, you know, said, hey, you know, you can get myocarditis from the vaccine. Yes, you can. The chances are two out of 100,000 of getting it. Two out of 100,000. So 0.02%. Two out of 100,000. So it's, it's relatively low, a low chance. It occurs mostly after the second dose, and it also occurs mostly in younger men. 20, 40, 20 to 40 year olds, younger men, they get this myocarditis. Majority of the myocarditis gets better. But I'll be fully transparent. I've heard of stories, you hear these stories, right? And it's probably the same person, but I've heard of stories you know, a friend of one of our colleagues, medical colleagues, whose brother got the vaccine and developed myocarditis and didn't get better and uh, ended up on a, like a heart transplant list somewhere. Is it possible? Yes. By the way, I looked up the incidence of dying when you get on a plane to fly to the Philippines. <laughs> you know what the incidence of that is? It's about 1.67 for 100,000. So, about the same. Yes, another que oh, question. Well, you said doctors, medical doctors recommend, uh, why do some medical doctors recommend steroid after COVID? So why do some medical doctors recommend steroids after COVID? Um, you know, steroids is sort of like a coverall for inflammation. So remember those, remember I showed you that slide where it showed all these inflammatory markers that come out and destroy not only the virus, but destroy your body? Steroids will suppress all of that. It's kind of like a last resort. Patients get better, by the way, because all the, because it's too much. I mean, it's like literally too much. You think about the whole thing where you're like, I hate to use this thing like beating a dead horse. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you throw these inflammatory, it's not going to help. That horse is not going to get any better. And when you get to that point where everything is shutting down because of inflammation, you use these steroids, it blocks that. It lets the body have a chance to heal, and sometimes it turns around. So that's why. Yeah. If steroids can do that, why does the government not allow ivermectin to be used? <laughs> So, I'm not gonna even answer that question because <laughs> we're going down the road of possibly not just medicine, but also politics as well. Yes. So why can't you vaccinate somebody who's three and a half years old? Why can't we vaccinate someone who's three and a half years old? So why can't you vaccinate? <laughs> I mean, you know, just like, every, just like every other medicine that we use, you know, it usually go, you know, you know, the vaccine it was being used under emergency use by the FDA because there weren't enough studies yet to show this, right? I mean, you know, in kids, that's like a whole other world. I mean, you don't want to be giving this to, to kids when you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but the trials or the studies are actually coming out saying whether or not it is safe. I don't know whose kids they're using, <laughs> but there are studies that are coming out that say that, you know, that it's, that it's safe for that age group. I don't know, Daphne, do you know what the youngest age group is right now? I thought it was middle-aged. Five. Okay. Yes, another question. Regardless of immunity, which is more susceptible, the younger ones or the older ones? Ah. So the question is, which one is, who is more susceptible to it, the younger people or the older people? All of the data tell us that it's older people. I had another slide, which I didn't show up here, but it showed risk factors or comorbidities. So if you have other medical problems on top of age, if you're older, you have more chance of having worse disease. Young people get it, and they kind of not get so sick compared to somebody who's older. You know, even if you're old and healthy, you still get sick. If you're old and you have other medical issues, even high blood pressure, even diabetes, if you have heart failure to start out with, no good. I mean, if you get this, I mean, you have to be very, very careful. A lot of my heart patients, they've just isolated themselves. They've gotten their vaccine and boosters. They just stay inside. And when they go outside, rarely, I mean, are they going to like the stores and all this? Because if they get it, ah, 
going to be very difficult to turn around. But to answer your question, older people are more susceptible to it in terms of also dying from it. Kids can spread it, though. <laughs> As we know, even from day, regular daycare, kids can spread this. Yes? So her comment is that the younger people, you can't disregard that it being you know, something that's dangerous for the kids as well because you remember that inflammatory, that inflammatory syndrome, multi-system inflammatory system that I showed you there? It's not just in adults. There's a multi-system inflammatory response in kids. It, it happens just in children and they shut down very quickly as well. So it does happen. How old is old? <laughs> so old so so the definition of old is whatever age you are and 10 years after that's old <laughs> yes another question well, it's not a question i just wanted to add that um a lot of the foods play a, a role in inflammation and inflammation like garlic, like tomatoes, beans, seeds, and stuff like that. So sometimes we worry about what I'm gonna do after I have the problem. So also we have to focus on what can I do to prevent the problem? What can help? There is no evidence that any, any food will cure anything. No, may help, yes. And so my invitation is, let's also focus on healthy eating, you know, and all those foods and alicine from the garlic and stuff like that. Those things might um, help my immune system or so, will help to anti-inflammatory situations. Yep. Just wanted to point that. Very good, anti-inflammatory. <laughs> Inflammation is sort of the root of a lot of this stuff that we're talking about here. Any other questions? I thought that would be more exciting to talk to you about than high blood pressure or something. <laughs> Another question. Another question, this is about diet. This is about diet. <clears throat> now, we know that mushrooms extend your lifespan. It what? Extends your lifespan, yeah, yeah. okay? Uh, your health span. What mushroom would help in prevention of this COVID? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it that in China they call reishi mushroom the mushroom of immortality. I don't know. I don't know. No, reishi. How? Yeah. You should tell my son he hates mushrooms. <laughs> well, for one thing, they discovered that in 2012, um, you know, mm -hmm. 19, yeah, 2012, they discovered that a, guy, a patient, this was in Australia, they, they discovered this patient with... Uh, cancer of the um, stomach. Mm. He was told to come back, but because the surgery schedule was heavy, he was able to come back only six weeks later. In the meantime, the a Chinese- um, They take the mushrooms. Yeah, the Chinese uh, <laughs> health practitioner, traditional Chinese yeah, medicine yeah. told him to take as much mushroom, reishi mushroom in particular, yeah, there, I mean, just, just so that you guys know, I mean, there are a lot of things that are out there in terms of what you hear um, as what is good for you and what can potentially be beneficial. Um, there was some kind of a, a Thai herb. What was the name of that Thai herb? There was, one, there was a Thai herb that was supposed to be like the cure-all of COVID. You take it and you're cured. And this, I think every Thai person knew about this because it went through social media and people took it it didn't make a difference at all. So, I mean, you gotta have these studies that actually prove this, and I think there's stuff out there. I really believe that there are herbs that we don't know about in nature that actually help with this stuff, but if you know it and you have the, the scientific ability to bring it to a lab and have them study this and, and formulate it, I, I mean, that's, that's, how, that's how medicine progresses, so. But thank you for the comment. 
Any other questions? Yes. Mm. They said it's from the calf. Mm. They said it's from the bat. Mm. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> there was a, an entire chapter on how these things come from these animals. I didn't read it. <laughs> but yes, you're right. I mean, that's, that's where it was initially supposedly came from. This area that they were talking about where it originated was in the marketplace where a lot of this stuff was not very clean. It was like a lot of raw stuff from what I hear. You know, like... You know, there was a reporter from the U.S. that came back to Utah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so remember, I was talking about here scientific information about COVID. When you start talking about this kind of stuff, very interesting to talk about. But you end up going down another road of, that's a different talk. <laughs> and so any questions about the science behind what I presented here? Anything else? Okay. Well, th oh, another word. Yes. Yes, yes. That's right. <laughs> So, all right, well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tessali. Uh, how many have been blessed by this presentation and who have been informed well? Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Tessali. Thank you, Anna. And uh, we are the temple. Your body is the temple of God. And I want just to emphasize that we are responsible for our body. And God entrusted our body, and we have to take care of it the most we can. And we have to follow and uh, take care of ourselves. So if there's any more that you want to say, Atilita. As everybody knows, my husband had COVID. He had a rough time. He belongs to the older generation. <laughs> he has diabetes. He has high blood pressure. And it was only God who got him through COVID. And thank you so much, everybody, for your prayer. He is recovering very well. Thank you for that, and uh, we're all praying for those people who have been affected, and whatever long-term effects they have, we are keeping on their prayers, and we are praying for them. So thank you, everybody, for coming, and we appreciate uh, your inputs and questions. So we are going to end this presentation with uh, Pastor uh, Nestor's uh, closing prayer. Is he here? I think I saw him earlier. He left? I cannot see him. Okay, can we just uh, do our prayer? Uh, or Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, Sabbath day, we thank you for being together today and uh, especially listen to uh, regarding our health, about COVID, about heart problem, about nutrition. Don't know, Lord, that you are the great physician and we are responsible for our body because you have told us that we are the temple. Our body is the temple of God. Thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath day, and bless each and every one of us as we uh, part from this place and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen.